more excited talk about deep learning and then how does deep learning help for the acoustic imaging and what we are doing working in that space. Um, again, uh, so those of you who are getting into medical imaging or those who are been working in the medical imaging, so the most important thing for you to realize is that actually what you talk about medical imaging is about actually the physics. So if you read the classical textbook that by Wishburg, it is essential physics of medical imaging. So when we talk about physics, we are really talking about technology, we are really talking about how does the radiation interact with the matter, how is the signal getting generated which you are able to see. So that's what we meant by physics, uh, not really the, the, in the, in the, 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 the hardcore physics which we are talking about. So uh, which means that essentially we got to look at uh, you know, how is the signal getting generated and how we are detecting it. So these are the two components which is going to be part of the physics and technology talk. Again, uh, just before we go further, uh, so this is the conflict of interest. So currently I work with these two companies, G Healthcare, Shell Technology Center, and as well as Biocon Foundation. But relevant to this talk, I don't have any conflicts of interest. And again, uh, so these are the, uh, those of you who are trying to get into photoacoustic, I would strongly suggest to read this book called as Biomedical Optics, and this chapter is chapter number 12, uh, which mainly deals with the physics and talking about quite a bit of things um, about <coughs> how is the signal getting generated, how is the signal uh, really gets detected, what are the limitations, and things like that. So again, um, I have taken the slide from there, I have taken the course of Leah Graham. Uh, so these are the slides from this course, which I am actually using liberally. I have asked permission from him, he said, okay, fine, go ahead. Uh, again, uh, so this is the uh, this is a whole view which you need to know. If you ask me what is the one slide you ask, you know, you should read, I would say this is the slide. So this has everything in it. And the rest of the things is mostly about dealing with, we are going to explain one by one what is happening. So what happens is that uh, we are going to refer to the photoacoustic imaging or photoacoustic tomography as an imaging which actually takes advantage of the photoacoustic effect. And I will, I will go on about what is the photoacoustic effect. Other than the biomedical application, there are other applications which are being used. And I will also talk about those uh, as we move along. So what happens in the photoacoustic effect is that, uh, at least in the imaging scenario, we are having an object which we want to image. Uh, what we do is that uh, we take a laser and we irradiate to this laser source. So essentially what we are sending is the light into the object. And then because of that light, what happens is that this light energy gets absorbed by the tissue. Uh, because this light which we send is in the, in the main infrared range, which means that it will be between 600,000 nanometers. Uh, where the absorption is much more, uh, absorption is more, so that all the chromatic force absorbs this energy, and because the light gets, you know, absorbed, now there is a thermoelastic expansion which happens. There is energy which got transferred from the light to the tissue, and then that causes what is called a thermoelastic expansion. And because we are sending a pulsed light, now that is going to be instantaneous effect. That means that the thermoelastic expansion is going to happen instantaneously. And then that, because of the thermal expansion, there is a, you know, acoustic wave which gets generated because we are sending these pulses, right, one after the other. And because of the pulses, there is an expansion, there is a contraction, there is an expansion, contraction. And the mechanical wave gets generated. And we put the outer sound, or you can say that we put the acoustic detectors, because outer sound refers to, as somebody already pointed out, both sending and receiving. Here you are only receiving. So you just put acoustic detectors all around the tissue, you collect that detectors. And then that means that you are collecting at time point t, and then what you are interested in is at time is equal to zero, what is the initial pressure? So that means that what you are talking about is because of this laser irradiation, how is the tissue initial pressure is? So we talk about the initial pressure which is P0. And what you are detecting is at the boundary at time is equal to P. So in a simple sense, what you are detecting at time P, and then you want to go back in time, everywhere in the tissue, of course you are detecting only at the boundary of the tissue. You want to know what is the initial pressure rise at time is equal to zero. Right? So this is what is called an initial value problem, those of you who work in mathematics. So that means that you are going back in time and then you want to know the initial value. Because right now you are detected somewhere. Of course this initial value you want everywhere in the domain, not only on the boundary. But what you are detecting at the boundary only at, at certain locations. So this is what it is this. So that means that the detected signal now has to be processed into the recon. And then you have to do the reconstruction so that you can get the initial pressure distribution. I'll talk about how does the initial pressure refer to the tissue physiology or pathophysiology as we move along. So is that clear for everybody? Has everybody got the main idea of what we are talking about? Yeah. 
Then we'll go into a little more details about what happens at every physics lab. So what you are doing is, so mainly the problem is that uh, why does photoelectric effect itself is required, right? So why not you send the light and detect the light, right? That, that makes it a lot more easier, right? So why you want to send the light and de detect the sound? doesn't make any sense for us, right? You can detect as well the light. Why not detect only the light so that you are done with it, right? So the problem is uh, the light uh, uh, has something called as what we call it as a diffraction limit. So that means that now uh, when we are trying to talk about the light as a, when we are irradiating and detecting, what we are talking about is that the light is going to have multiple interactions with the tissue. So one of the interactions is absorption, another one is called as scattering. So that means that some of the light will get absorbed. Some of the light will also get scattered. So this scattering is what causes what is called as a resolution loss for us. And most of your detected signal is actually the scattering signal. So just imagine like this, right? So now I'm sure you have done this experiment, right? So you take the torch light and put it on your, on your hand. Now what happens is when you put it on the hand is all these edges will get glowed. And you get this like red tinge kind of glow. But in the middle, there is nothing. Right? So that means that it's very simple. The light is not getting propagated through this hand. Wherever the thickness is smaller, it is getting propagated. So this is what we call as diffraction limit. So that means that whenever there is a thick tissue, it cannot pass through. Only when there is a thin tissue, which we call as ballistic range, that means that the number of interactions are quite small, then it can pass through. The absorption is not there. So there is inherently this limit of this ballistic imaging which results in this. And then this breaking this diffraction limit, that means that you want to irradiate and you want to go through the thick tissue, will actually lead to what is called super resolution. So what is that meant is, I will talk about it in a little, little more when we go to a little more slides. What we meant is, the light which you are detecting when it has multiple interactions, it has lost the information about the spatial resolution. It has lost the information about where the interaction has happened. So that means that you compromise on the resolution for you. Because now what you are detecting is an effect of multiple interactions. So you cannot go back and say that pinpoint it that this interaction has happened here so that you can really resolve very well those events. So whenever you have these multiple interactions, it is always a problematic for us in terms of pinpointing where the interaction has happened. So that is what we will lose to what is called as loss of resolution. And that is what we don't want. So in the protocol effect, what you are telling is that there is an initial where you are irradiating the laser and each one of the laser or each part of the organ or each part of the tissue type is going to absorb the light differently. And that means that the expansion is going to be different in each one. And that interaction you can pinpoint and say that that is what you have. So now this is what we say that, right? So the diffusion limits the penetration of this ballistic imaging. Ballistic imaging means that having very less interactions. So the diffusion will limit you this. So what is meant by diffusion, right? So think about like this. So now you have a glass of water and you just put a, you know, a drop of ink. Now what happens to the glass of water when you put ink, right? It slowly diffuses. And after a certain time, you don't see ink at all. Right? It uniformly distributes itself, in place, right? So now you put lesser ink, what happens to this? You don't see the effect very much, right? If you put more ink, what happens is that now it becomes darker and darker and darker and darker. After a certain time, what happens? You keep on putting the ink. After a certain time, there is no interaction that happens. And you cannot even figure it out because everything has become now in So similarly, now if you think about it, if you are irradiating the laser source, and if you irradiate for too much time, we call it a saturation. One is that you can't irradiate for too much time because there is some safety limit which you want to follow, which is called a galaxy limit. So the maximum allowed is actually one watt per centimeter square is what you allow. So that means that you can't really keep on irradiating so that you can get signal more and more. But you have a limit which you want to get, and that we want to encompass in the photoelectric effect so that we can get it. If I put the source to be very small, it cannot penetrate through thick tissues. That's another issue. So again, so we want to get this diffusion limit so that we can image deeper tissue. That is what is photoelectric effect is supposed to do. That is supposed to allow you to image deeper hot tissues. Now again. Um, in the, in the relative sense, right, so the, in the optical imaging modalities, there are multiple optical imaging modalities which does uh, imaging. So one of the famous ones is an optical coherence tomography. I'm sure if any of you are getting eye testing done, today optical coherence tomography is common. And almost all ophthalmology offices have this OCT, which has been the most successful optical imaging modality which is around. 
and uh, it's not as well known, right? But imaging depth is quite poor. So you can only image up to one and one. That's why they're able to image only the cornea. Not also the deeper part of cornea, they're only talking the peripheral part of the cornea. So it doesn't do anything more than one and one. And uh, its resolution is excellent. So if we talk about roughly about tens of microns there, you can get tens of microns resolution. Uh, there is a strong spectral artifacts like ultrasound. Ultrasound also has spectral artifacts. So OCT also has these spectral artifacts. The static coefficient is quite strong, then because of that only you have a spectral which is coming up most of the time. So the other one is that this diffuse optical tomography which images thick tissues. So that means that what you do now is that you try to image only the soft tissue. Now when I was talking about the hand, it is not a soft tissue. It is, has a bone and as well as soft tissue, muscle, everything, right? Now here you try to image only the soft tissue. So here the contrast is excellent again because, you know, your blood flow of course will have, you know, hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, water, you have different absorption spectra. So you can get very good excellent. You can get up to 5 centimeter depth, which you can go. But resolution is quite poor because as I told you, when you have multiple scattering, multiple events, it's very hard to point out where the interaction has happened, which means that you lose the resolution So about 5 mm is what you can get typically resolution. There are no stable artifacts. The scattering coefficient, even though it's strong, still you don't have the resolution which you wanted. And whenever we talk about having a 5 mm, half a centimeter for a typical tumor is almost at stage 2. Right? So we, it has moved away from neoplasia to what we call as tumor stage 2. So if you want to detect early the cancer or any of the physiologies early, you know, having resolutions like half a centimeter is not good enough. Right? So this is similar to doing nuclear uh, medicine, right? Where you are doing a very targeted, you know, uh, uh, binding point. But the problem with the nuclear medicine is that the resolution is quite good. That's why what you do is that you combine with CT, right? Typically the fat is combined with CT, spectra is combined with CT so that you can get that resolution. Similarly here, right, the DOT doesn't have that kind of resolution. So you have to combine with something else to really get that kind of resolution which you are looking for. So that means that you look at for the physiological properties for the DOT, for the structural properties or the morphological things, you look at another one, like in that be CT, RMR, or whatever. So now again, our other song, uh, again, this is a debatable topic, right? Now the modern technologies are, are really doing very well in this space, especially with uh, which can do a lot of functional imaging. Uh, but currently it is very poor for any cancers, right? And again, uh, so this, this, this is universal acceptable. And then again, uh, so this imaging depth is really the other sort of main advantage is what we call a scalability. You can go from microns to millimeters, right? And all you need to do is change your ultrasound sort of, you know, head, right? You look, you look at different frequencies and you can go. It's a scalable. So that means that the same equipment can work as your intravenous ultrasound. And the same equipment can work for you to do breast imaging. So that way it is very good, right? And again, the resolutions, you know, you can go up to 0 0.3, 0 0.1. Also now, people are talking about micro resolution, especially in the US. The spectral artifacts are very strong. And then the spatting coefficient is relatively weak. So we talk about not having much scattering in the ultrasound. Even though there is, there is a little bit of scattering, but it's a weak one. That means that you can really get a very good image without having scattering to be worried about. Right? So you need not compensate for scattering in the ultrasound. That's one advantage you have. So what is the problem with ultrasound? Has anybody understood what is the main problem with ultrasound? Why a lot of the clinicians are not very happy with ultrasound? So one of the main problems with ultrasound is that it is always operator dependent. It all, your image quality depends on who is operating. And if you have an excellent sonographer, your, your what I call it as clinical centers run very well. They will not move away from ultrasound. Because all that sonographer is doing is that he is an excellent operator. And if he understands very well what to do, he will get you excellent images, he will get you very good diagnostic accuracy at a very cheap price. The problem is now, if that sonographer is not available to you, and then if your operator happens to be a new person, right, he doesn't know what he is looking at, then you are going to get very, very bad images. So then, then interpreting them is going to be extremely difficult. That is one of the difficulties of the ultrasound currently exists. <coughs> of course, we talk about the machine driven, we talk about protocols where you can do automated uh, you know, uh, acquisitions. But still it is in fancy, not really come out in the market. So that is one of the biggest drawback of the ultrasound. Because it becomes an operator dependent, of course it's a complicated technology as such. Uh, you are talking about a lot of interactions and then trying to capture an image which is there. And then you are talking about contrast hidden in the spectrum. 
And the, the reading of those images is also not straightforward. Of course, there are, there are multiple technologies which have adapted very well. For example, like cardiac imaging, echo has been the standard right? So there are, there are multiple of them which have really translated itself at a very high clinical level. But not much has been happening in this what I call it as automated protocols. Even now, the protocols are mainly what I call it as operator driven. So if the operator is knowledgeable of what he is trying to look at, so they will do it very well. They don't require a very fancy ultrasound to do imaging. Right? So even when there is a difference in this. So when we talk about imaging, what we are talking about is just removing that sending part. And then what we are telling is that we are going to read it with a laser. And then all we are trying to do is detect with the ultrasound detectors. That means that at least from purely from the detection point of view, ideally, the PAD system, if you are buying an acoustic detector, you, know, you do not have the generation part. Right? You just need only detection. But having said that, right, whether it is a transmission or a detection, or whether it is generation or detection, actually the technology is almost the same. You use the same RF electronics. The only thing is that you are switching between whether you are generating or detecting. Right? So in, in terms of cost, it doesn't really reduce any cost. Right? So that's something which you have to understand. Right? So it is as good as using an ultrasound sleep machine. So nowadays the PAD systems which people talk about use commercial ultrasound machines right, to do the detection, right? not, not the around the transmission. Again, it's good. Imagine that it's good and scalable like ultrasound. And again, resolution is excellent. And again, like because the detection mechanism is ultrasound, Whatever ultrasound has, it has that advantage. And the one thing which PAN doesn't have is what is called a spectrum. So that means the interpretation of these images are going to be relatively easy for anybody to look at. Right? Again, the standard commission is mixed because the reason is that still your generation mechanism is dependent on laser source. So that means that there is going to be a scattering which is going to happen because the light itself scatters quite a bit. And, uh, and that means that at, at different depths, you are going to have a different scattering coefficient. At, 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 at relatively lower depths, you may not have so much scattering, but at higher depths, you are going to have a lot more scattering. But again, um, so uh, we call it as uh, something called as transform free free path. So that means that what we are talking about is, as such, your, your tissue has a lot of scattering. And what we want to do is that we want to focus on a particular area such that we can get a very good resolution. So it is called as focusing into the scattering media. And especially when you want to focus into the scattering media, what we say is that you are making transport free path without getting scattering, whatever information you are getting is what has the highest resolution. So that means that what we are talking about transport free, free path is how much distance does a radiation travel without having a, with, without having a single interaction. The first moment it has an uh, interaction, right? that is what we say is that the scattering event has happened there. And then reverse of that time is what you see the distance. So currently we say that about 0.1 centimeters or 1 mm is what typically tissue allows you to have a uh, scattering. So that means that for every 1 mm, there is at least one scattering event that is happening. So that means that if you have 5 mm, what will happen? Right? There is going to be 5 scattering events that are going to happen. So that is what is happening currently for our resolution. So that is what is really limits this. So you can get much more. So you can get into focus depending on what depth you are looking at. Now you can see that the at the lower depths, your focus can be as, as good as going into almost like you know uh, almost into the five mm kind of a range. You can really focus very well here compared to the relatively higher depths. Now again, uh, so as I told you, I'll just give an example of what where does the fat works very well compared to the optical one. So this gives you a good illustration of this. What is happening in diffuse light is you are you are sending light and you are detecting the light. And the light is going through multiple scattering events. It's not going in straight lines. When the scattering happens, it's going to change its direction. So it's not going to go in straight lines. So that means the detected event, you don't know where it is happening exactly in this. It's all randomized in some sense. So now uh, when we say clear light out, so the other one is uh, what you do is that you want to now decrease the tissue depth because you are telling a lot here when you want to image deeper ones, you are having more scattering. So now what happens in surgery is that you can remove that tissue and then shine the light. So that is what you can do, right? So that means that you create that light. You open a window for it so that you can see that light. So that is a more becomes more invasive. It is no longer a non-invasive imaging. 
So now you are, you are doing the surgical procedure and then you are shining the light. So the whole thing might have changed. So that there is something called as uh, optical clearing. That means that what you do is that now you give certain draft so that it becomes optically opaque. It looks like as if it is not going to do any scattering eventually. It is going to look very plain, right? like making it more like a glass. Right? It is called as optical clearing. There is much uh, into this kind of literature where you are develop developing drugs to do optical clearing. For so that means when you set the light, then what you make sure is that you just make sure that this tissue is getting clear so that it comes in straight up. Then you can do it. What we are doing in the uh, photocaustic tomography is we are just setting the light. We are not doing any clearing or we are not cutting out any of the tissue. All we are doing is that we are generating this ultrasound wave and that ultrasound wave has very less scattering. It is going to travel in straight line for us and then we are going to repair. Based on that, we are going to go back and pinpoint where the event has. This is essentially what happens in the photographic conversion. Now again, uh, photographic is not really meant for actually for the imaging purposes. So the originally when uh, Graham Bell did that, he was meant for using it for actual telecommunication. So what he was talking about is mostly about the light absorption, there is a temperature rise, so the light comes here. And there is thermonic elastic extraction and then acoustic emission is happening and then we are able to hear using the ground. And that means that what we are doing is we are using light as a production of the sound. Right? So now what happens? Why do you want to use light for the production of the sound? So if you think about it, what happens typically, right? So the sound travels much slower than the light. That's why you first see the light thing and then we are the light. Right? So that means that if you want to transmit anything fast, then you've got to use the light. But then ultimately, if you want to use it for telecommunication, you've got to hear sound. So his original idea was that you use light as a transmitter. And when you are hearing, you just convert it using photoacoustic effects so that you can hear them. That's what his idea was. And he's not new, right? So this is around 8 minutes. And, and right now, what we are doing is also same, right? We are just sending the light. And we are converting it to sound. The tissue is converting into sound. And we are detecting that sound. That's essentially what happens. So that's so ideally you have embedded your your sound into that light, right? So that light is having that kind of energy so that it can do that. Now again, um, so when we have to do this, um, so the problem is that we are always talking about the source. So even under sound is mostly about what we call the reflections. The reflection is at the boundaries where you have this acoustic impedance mismatch. Right? Here, we are not no longer worried about these boundaries, we are worried about the source. So that means we send the laser light and the laser light is getting absorbed by these multiple sources. And all you want to do is that you want to pinpoint where the source is. So for that, uh, the famous technique for you know, identifying a source is to do triangulation. So that means that you do three detectors. So you have these three detectors, you assume that sound wave is traveling at a constant speed. This is very important assumption. I'll come back to this when we talk about it. But we assume that there is a source and then you have this three detectors. Now at these detectors, you are going to observe the sound at a particular time point, right? So maybe T1, T2, T3. It might be the same detector which you are rotating. Right? So you do that. And then based on this, you know, product of the time does, it will tell you how much distance it is there from the observing. And then you can come back and then triangulate that and then see that the source is right here. So this is what we want to do. So now what is the problem with this? To identify one source, how many detectors I need? I need three detectors. Right? So that is what triangulation is telling me, right? So now just do the back of the of calculation. So I want to form an image of 100 by 100. So to form 100 by 100, so how much is this? Right? So about 10,000. Right? So 10,000 sources are there so because each pixel can be acting as its own source. So how many detecting points are required? 30,000. So that is 30,000 detectors you are talking about for getting 100 by 100 image. That's quite large. So we don't want to really do that, right? So if you want to go back and really go back and do the triangulation, to form a 100 by 100 image, I need to have 30,000 things. Because each one of them is going to have its own independence, its own degrees of freedom, and things like that. So this we don't want to do. Again, so there's another issue which we have um, is that there is a certain laser pulse width which we talk about. So ideally what we have assumed all along is that the laser pulse which we are sending has really like a delta pulse, it's a delta function. Right? But you know in reality there is nothing like a delta function. 
So it could have a certain width point. Now that way this would affect our resolution. That is what we don't want or we want even really know what is our limit of the resolution is such that we can say that now if you are using this laser pulse, this is the resolution I am going to get. Right? This is something which we have to do as a, as a backup dynamic calculation. So that if somebody says that can I form a sub-micron resolution photoacoustic image, then we want to say that what is the laser you need to buy. Right? So that is something which we need to do. So now again, uh, so there is something called as thermal relaxation time. So that means that what we do is that uh, for the soft tissue there is a thermal diffusion. So that means that not everything is going to be staying at the same place. Right? One assumption we are making is the source is highly localized. But in reality, the, the temperature rate is going to transmit among the tissue also. Right? So there is a diffusivity that is going to happen for the for the temperature as well. So that is called as thermal diffusivity. For soft tissue, you can say that that is about 0.13 millimeters per second is roughly the number which you can put. And this is what is called as uh, uh, characteristic level. What is the resolution you are looking at? So if you tell me the uh, average resolution, because this is text, I can go back and then really look at it, what is the number of which I need to do. So if I assume that DC is 15 microns, I can say that the thermal relaxation time has to be 1.7 milliseconds. So when we say thermal relaxation time 1.7 milliseconds, what we are telling is the next pulse has to come right after the relaxation. So that's what we are talking about. The repeatability of these pulses has to be within this limit. So again, there is something called a stress relaxation time. Similar to what we are talking about thermal. So here you have the speed of sound instead of the uh, thermal diffusivity, you have the speed of sound. Again, we assume that it is 1500 meters per second. Of course, people can argue that it is 1540, 1530. But right now, here we have assumed 1500 meters per second. And then if DC is 50 micron, is what you are really looking at. You want to form the images which are about roughly 50 micron. Your TS tends to be 10 nanoseconds. So now that means that your laser pulse rate has to be less than this. If it is not less than this, you cannot get this information. But if you turn around and ask the problem, if I am using certain laser of having certain, you know, a certain pulse rate, then I can go back and calculate what will be my resolution which I am really talking That is a theoretical limit. Again, all this is based on theoretical limits. Of course, there is a lot of assumptions here. One is that we are assuming that speed of sound is constant through the tissue. That is itself is a big assumption. Another is, we are also assuming that thermal diffusivity is also constant over the tissue, which is also another biggest of <coughs> So that's what we, we want to do. Now again, this one is a little busy slide here. Uh, what we want to look at is that um, the, how does the expansion affect us in terms of getting the signal? Because ultimately what we are interested in is getting the sound wave. We want to know that now we have sent the laser, we know what kind of laser we have sent, what is the pulse width is. Now it has caused some thermal and as well as stress you know, expansions, right? There's a diffusivity which is also getting lost. And we want to know now what is the signal strength is going to be. How much is going to be the signal strength which is going to come out of it. And again, uh, so there is something called as Gruntian coefficient. I'll come back to this when we talk about temperature sensing. So this is what actually really determines what is going to be the total expansion is going to happen because of this. So that means that what it is going to tell you is if there is a temperature raise because you are sending because of the laser, right? how much is going to be that is going to form in terms of the total volume expansion and as well as total tissue relaxation. So again, uh, so you need not worry about it, but I will just like to tell you that the initial pressure induced by the short pulse is directly proportional to this. So where we say that beta times T by K, K is this what we call it as uh, this uh, uh, aromatic uh, coefficient. But it also has a little bit of correlation towards the compressibility of the tissue. Right? So if it is highly compressible, like we say that the initial pressure rise may not be so much, like if its K is much higher. But typically for soft tissues, K is much lower, so the initial pressure rise is going to be much higher. So then you are going to have all these terms, like because of this Gaussian coefficient, which we call it as this beta times T times all this, is going to be there. So in a simple sense, what is going to happen is that if your tissue is, happens to be a soft tissue, you are going to have initial pressure rise being much higher compared to the one which is like a bone. Because where the speed of sound is much higher and then it is not going to have so much initial pressure rise. Right? And depending on the stiffness of the tissue, now your initial pressure rise is going to change 
very much. Right? So it is similar to the other sound what you are doing here. Now again, uh, you can turn it on and also use this technology to really sense the temperature. Because initial pressure rise is directly dependent on the temperature. So now if I can reconstruct the initial pressure, I can also go back and sense what the temperature of the tissue is. So that is something which you could do. Again, those of you who are interested in, you can look at this. Of course, you can get sensitivities up to about what we say is about 0.15 degrees is what is currently the sensitivity is. And your uh, temporal resolution is about 2 seconds. But typically, if you are doing like high food, 2 seconds is not good enough. You are talking about somewhat around millisecond resolution in terms of uh, temperature for the temperature of detection. So, this is only for theoretically just calculating and then saying that yes, photoacoustic imaging can do temperature sensing. Now again, so uh, you can also turn around and then ask, like you know, you are, we are only talking about temperature sensing, which is more about thermal diffusivity. But you can also come back and then look at stress and, and, and as well as strain relations. And then look at it, how does this thermal confinement conditions vary because of the stress? And then uh, there is something called as lifetime of the excitation state. So that means that, remember, when we send the laser, pulse laser, so for it, small time the temperature is going to raise and because of the diffusivity the temperature raise is going to fall down very quickly. Right? You can say that the temperature raise is what is called an excited state. Now that is the energy which has absorbed because of the laser. Now it has to come down to the ground state. Right? So that means that it has to emit that as a sound wave. So that what is the lifetime of that excited state is going to be. So that I need to go back and look at it. How fast should be my ultrasound detection scheme should what should be frequency I should be using. And this essentially gives you that. And uh, currently there are, there are many things, so then we talk about the hand repeat a second and as well as other things. I'll come back to this when we talk about deep learning because I, 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 ideally here when we talk about peak seconds, we are talking about having this kind of frequency for the P0 or the initial pressure could be in, in multiples of megahertz. Not only at lower frequencies, the signal also exists in megahertz. Now again, um, so now what has happened is that till now we are only talking about signal generation, right? So I sent the laser, it has been absorbed by the tissue and then because of the absorption there is a thermoelastic expansion which has happened and that thermoelastic expansion obviously has, uh, you know, has effects on the thermal diffusivity and all that and then it has expanded, now it has generated that sound waveform. Now that sound wave is going to propagate through the tissue before it goes to the thing because uh, as I told, we always keep the detectors at the boundary of the tissue. And we are interested in detecting at the boundary of the tissue. So now that means that the initial pressure now has to propagate through the tissue. That propagation is what we use it as this production wave equation. The simple wave equation, and any wave equation have this kind of thing, where this P0 is your initial pressure. Now again, remember the P0 depends on the position. Right? So it varies along the tissue. And then uh, we are assuming there is a delta excitation. So we assume that the pulse is a delta source, is what we have assumed. And then there is the speed of sound which comes in, and then there is this, you know, double order one where we are talking about looking at the addition of it. And then this is what we are going to detect. P of R of T, the R is not everywhere in the tissue, but at the boundary of the tissue, is what we are going to detect. Again, I just want to identify here the Vs is the speed of sound. Now remember when it is when it is propagating. We assume that the Vs is actually constant to make it the modeling very, very simple. Okay? Of course, there is no confinement here that we need to use Vs being constant. But for simplicity, for getting a good solution, we assume that Vs is constant. And the period of R is what is called as initial stress distribution or initial pressure rise. I told you about that. It depends on the this crucial coefficient, which is the omega, which depends on the adiabatic expansion. Here, R is what is called a spatial absorption functions. That is absorption of the laser light by the tissue promoters. So that is the tissue property, the internal property which we are talking about. And then again, I told you this is the inclusion coefficient which has a certain speed of sound and as well as the beta. This is the volume expansion coefficient and this is the key which involves the body in sequence. Now in, in a simple fashion, what we are talking about is this side of the equation is what is your sources. This side is what it is telling you how it is propagating with respect to time and the position. And then what we are detecting is this P of R of P, a sample version of P of R of P at the bottom. And then what we are interested in is, in a real experiment, we want to go back from this P which is detected at, at the boundary to the P0. 
right? So this is what we are interested in going back. Now the easiest one for us <coughs> to do is to write it like a Green's function. Because we are anyway assume that it is a delta function. Right? So on the right hand side there is a delta. Now I can go back and write how does this E of R0 comma T at a particular location will look like right? with respect to the others. Right? So now again I will not go into the details. Those of you who are interested in can always look up. So there is a, for the wave equation, Green's function solution is existing from past 100 years. So it's a very simple solution which you can really use. And all it has is this real function which is coming out to be this, and then you can go back and it. Now again, uh, you can do a Fourier transform so that it becomes a little more manageable for us because in that we are assuming that drawing the time domain. When you do a Fourier transform, you are talking about doing it in the frequency domain, so that it becomes a little more simpler. So that means that, uh, so I think Ratan is going to talk about this. They use the frequency domain solutions quite a bit. So whereas in the real time, we don't even use these solutions. I'll tell you how we use it in the real time. Because this gets into a little more complications when you try and use Green's function. So now again, we assume that it's a monochromatic spherical plane, and then your solution simply becomes an exponential Bessel. It becomes a Bessel function, and then you can write it down like a nice expansion of the Bessel functions of the third order fifth order. And then you can write down these solutions. So again, uh, so this is what I was talking about. So now what you are doing here is, this is all assuming that you are not really exciting, it is point by point. So we have assumed in all this is that there is only a delta source, and the delta source is exciting one delta uh, point, that means it is exciting one pixel, and we are only talking about that pixel getting property. But in reality, it is going to excite the whole tissue. So every one of the tissue particle is going to become a source. So if you are talking about 100 by 100 pixels, each pixel is going to act as a source. Right? So that means that you have 10,000 sources now emitting the photoacoustic wave. So what you are going to get at the boundary is not, is not really one single energy, right? one single time. It's going to convolution of all the sources together is what is going to be detected. So it's a real linear combination of all the sources which are these 10,000 pixels which are going to come and get detected. That's what this is doing. Essentially what we are trying to do is now when we excite, there, is, there are a couple of other issues as well. Now, um, one is this, what we are calling is pulse wave. The other one is, as it is propagating through the tissue, what happens is that, like a diffusion I was telling you. Now what happens when you put a, uh, you know, ink into the, into the glass bottle? On the top it is a drop. When you go deeper and deeper, what happens? It becomes more and more spread out. Right? So this is what we call as one expansion. So that means that what it is going to look, the light propagation, it is no longer going to be a, a simple pulse which is like a delta here. It is going to expand itself as it is going. Of course, the intensity is going to come down, but it is going to expand the source. That expansion is what you are interested in also accounting for. Because as the depth is getting increased, you are going to have more spread out of this energy. In the original one, you are highly focused. But as your depth is getting more and more, you are no longer focused. It's going to become slightly diffused. Right? Of course, the intensity is going to come down in this case. Now again, um, so we talk about uh, this from a SAB in optical scattering media. So, so there is a, by the way, one thing which I thought of, I'll go back to this. Uh, so those of you who are not really, who wants to really do this, actually all the homework self is, uh, all the, uh, what I call it as source codes, whatever I'm presenting here, are available in this website. So I'll give also this slide so that it can be distributed to people. Um, so people can get this, these are all MATLAB based, so you can get those codes, you can run those codes, you can generate whatever simulations I'm talking And uh, if those of you who are want to be instructors, you will be able to provide you the whole solutions as well. And again, so he has given these lectures much more in detail. I'm cutting down a lot of stuff so that we can cover that whole material in one day, just given for one week, the photo effect effect itself. So those of you who are interested in really looking at it, all those state ones of giving, giving those presentations are available. So you can really leisurely go through all the photo ones, one after the other, one after the other. I think it's, it's close to about 400 slides or so. So I'm just trying to present it in about, about 45 slides. Then 1 is to 10 is what I'm doing. So going back to this, so one thing is that uh, we are talking about this 
having this kind of slap and also there is a time delay. So now what is happening is the initial pressure has raised at certain point and by the time we are detecting this source, right, it is going to take certain time to propagate. Now there are multiple things to be considered for us here. One is that if it is at the center of the tissue, let's assume that and then I am putting at the, like, imagine like a circle, if I am at the center, the time it is going to take to reach to one of the boundaries is going to be uniform. It's all the same, same time, right? But it is slightly off-centered. So this pressure wave is going to reach to the detector. For one side it is going to come faster, the other side it is going to come a little later. Right? And then we are talking about superposition of everything. Right? So that is something which you have to understand that is the leading combination of all the sources which are present. Again, when we talk about slab, we, we talk about it, how is it going to change the slab, how is this propagating pressure from the heated slab is going to come out. Again, what happens to the delta excitation in the pulse? Again, so this is a slightly busy slide. So we always assume that uh, the, the, the pulse which we are sending is actually a sphere. There are certain radius for it because we say that it is a laser spot, right? Those of you, when I, uh, so I can show this, right? So now we imagine the laser is always like a spot. It's like a, like a sphere, right? Of course, it's supposed to be a 3D. Now all you are seeing is a projection which is a 2D. So it's a sphere which is actually sending us, right? Whereas this is a continuous wave. When you talk about a pulse, all it, all it is going to do is that it is going to send that pulse as a sphere. All the energy is encapsulated in the sphere. Then we are going to talk about sphere being, uh, being this. Now again, uh, so this is something what happens with this, right? So when we send it like this, like ultrasound, what happens is that there is a pressure rise and as well as a pressure fall. Because we are going to switch off the laser after a certain time. So that means that there is going to be an expansion which is an excited state. When it is going to come down, it is going to come down to a state where it is going to relax a little Because there is stress confinement which has happened and it is going to suddenly relax and then come back. So that means that the pressure is going to raise and then again fall. Like other sound, right? So that is what mechanical waves do. Right? There is a rarefaction and a compression. Right? The compression and rarefaction is going to come accompany this. Same way here there is a rise and as well as a fall. So the compression and rarefaction happens here also. So, now forget about whatever I have said till now. So if you just want to understand the way we do photoelectric imaging, currently the biggest application is in the pre-clinical imaging. That means that we are imaging the eyes. So what we do is that we irradiate the laser, and typically we, we try to put it in an axial element, which is about 20 mm joules per centimeter square. And that means that what we do is that we have this mice. Typically, it's nude mice. We shave off the you know, hair and everything. We irradiate it, and now what happens is that the light absorption happens. And then there is a millikelvin rise in the temperature, which is going to allow us to get this sound wave. And this sound wave is going to have around, we say that because of the millikelvin, it is going to cause about 8 millibars. 8 millibars will roughly about 800 particles is what is going to come out. And then this ultrasonic emission is happening in, the, in this millibar range. And all we are doing is we are going to put the detectors and detect. Right. That's all we are doing. Now, if you have to do at different depths, Right? The only way is, now I just, all I just need to do is that we assume that it is all getting related here. Now we just move this ultrasonic array up and down so that we can get at different depths. That's all we are doing. But of course this is assuming one thing is that your laser source is going to be uniform throughout the depth. The source is going to be spreading all across this uniform, which is actually not really true. So what is going to happen is that we are going to detect at this, this surface. Really, we are not going to detect exactly at the boundary. We are going to immerse it in some kind of coupling medium so that we are not really doing a touching one. It's going to be a surface which we are going to do. And then our initial pressure is essentially the, the contrast which is going to give. It depends on multiple things. One is that what you call as beam formats. So that means that how well we are able to focus the laser light so that there is thermal expansion which is going to happen. That is what is called as beam forming. So it's going to depend on the beam forming. And there is going to be something called as high frequency problem. So now if there is a high frequency which gets generated, now the problem of the sound waves at high frequency is it gets alternated very fast. Right? So the high frequency components alternate very fast. So their chances of reaching the detector is much lower compared to the lower frequencies. Right? So that's what is happening. So there is a loss because of the high frequency. Right? Because the high frequency components have much loss. 
and then that is what is also going to cause a little bit of delay for us. Obviously, we are going to check at a certain time. That's what is happening. Now, now you can really do that. <coughs> now, uh, again, uh, what we do is that if you are really only looking at the detector signal and want to form an image, I think there is a session on the photoacoustic microscopy in the in the next one. There we don't do anything with that. We just get the detector signal. Like ultrasound, what we do is that like a B scan, we just put line by line. So that means that all we do is that get that signal, just say that this signal has come at certain depth. So that depth is what we are going to form. That's going to form a line. And then when we get a time t plus delta t, that is going to form the next line, which is going to be below that. So we are just going to form this line by line by line by line. It's going to fill up depth wise, depending on the time. How about doing in time? Okay. So that means that if I am doing 0D, which is point by point, that means that I am doing line by line. So in, in, when we say point by point, for 3D, for 2D it is point, for 3D it is going to be a line. Right? So it's going to be a surface by For 2D it is going to be line by line. So there are many ones if we do that. The concoctal microscopy, two photon, optical photoacoustic microscopy, that's what I was talking about photoacoustic. Where you are not doing any processing of the data. All you are doing is just putting it in the image. You are trying to fill in those pixels with this detector values. The 1D1 is what is called as projection tomography. That means that you are no longer looking at the point, but what you are doing is that you somehow want to back propagate this and then get that. In 2D, we call it as photoacoustic uh, tomography or photoacoustic uh, computer tomography, where we try to do a spherical projection from it. I'll come back to this photoacoustic tomography when we talk about a little more about the recon. Uh, I will tell you about that. And in 3D, we talk about diffuse optical tomography where you are forming a full 3D volume out of it, where you are looking at diffusion limit as well. Now, again, uh, so what we are interested in the recon world is now I get this P of what we call it as entity detection location, I am getting this R0. And then I, what all I am interested in is that now I am interested in going back in time and then reconstructing everywhere in the domain. Right? So, Let's look back and, and then look at this, what I was telling you about. So, we are only detecting at this location, but we are interested in reconstructing this whole part. But remember, I am only detecting at the boundary. And I want to reconstruct everywhere in the domain. So, what happens in the X-ray CT also? CT also, what happens? We send the X-rays, and then we detect on the boundary, and then we are interested in what happens at the interior. So we got to do some kind of what we call is projections. So this sending of the X-rays and then detecting something on the other end is called as projection. So I'm getting projection there. From that projection, I want to reconstruct back what is there in the interior of the domain. So that's what we need to do. So for that, we need to do what is called as time reversal. That means that what I need to do is I'm getting a signal at time is equal to t, but I am interested in signal at time 0, t is equal to 0. So I need to go back in time, so this is called as time reversal, or our projection has to be in time rather than in space, so that we can come back to this. So there is something called as one of spherical wave, so if we assume that it is a spherical wave, the sound wave is also spherical wave, then you can go back and look at the solutions, and that gives you something like, as I told you, this is, this is more like a Bessel function, and based on the Bessel function, you just write back, and then you look at it, what is your distance? So R0 is what you are detecting. And you look at it, what is R prime is, and then you just back from that with the time which is there. This is the big picture. But again, um, <coughs> you can do the similar part in terms of the time. Right? You put this, you do the high frequency contribution, you just integrate it, and then you get what is P0 of R is everywhere in the So rather than doing as a Bessel function, you just do like integration here, and then you get back down. But in reality, this requires quite a bit of measurement. As I told you, this is more like equivalent to doing a triangulation. So you require a lot and lot of measurements to get a very good resolution. Right? So again, uh, so uh, uh, we could talk about what is going to be the PSF isotopic, uh, the homogeneous one. Again, this is a uh, Bessel function if you are talking about having the first order Bessel function in terms of what is the right phase in terms of the PSF. Uh, and if a detector happens to be having certain width, that is what is a problem for us. So if it is a point detector, then you are really detecting points, and then you are also reconstructing for points. But if a detector is, typical ultrasound will have a sectors, 
right? It will have 128 sectors, it will have these kind of sectors which have certain width for it. Now you got to account for it. <coughs> so the way we account for it is that we do uh, what is called as reciprocity. So when we talk about reciprocity, what is it meant is whether your detector, when you reverse the source and detector, ideally you should get the same signal. So that means that when we talk about laser is having certain web, or your ultrasound detector is having certain web, ideally the both of them are equal. So that means that you go back and look at it now, what is kind of resolution you can get. Because earlier we have detected what is the resolution is, same way you can do it here. What is going to be the resolution of this? Of course it is going to be slightly complicated than that, because the reason is, so the, the, the ultrasound detector is typically curved. You don't have a flat detectors. Right? You have curved detectors is what is common. When it is curved, then you have an angle of acceptance. So then you got to account for that angle of acceptance. It's a little more complicated than what I was saying. Again, so we are not doing an angle, but if you are doing a more like a sector base, so then it becomes a slightly easier problem to deal with. Then you talk about what is going to be the pulse width and, and things like that. Uh, again, yeah, I just want to point out here uh, uh, what is the main thing which comes as an advantage for optical imaging. Because ultimately, you are currently the source is optics, and right? you are sending optical energy. Right? So, if you look at it, so the way these are the wavelengths which we are talking about. So, if you look at the 601, you see what is going to be the absorption formation for the hemoglobin. It's going to be huge. So that number is what we are talking about is about 10 to the power 4. Right. In terms of contrast, that is like almost like you know a thousand contrast which we are doing. Typically your MR or ultrasound, the contrast is going to be roughly around three to four, the intrinsic contrast without using a contrast agent. At max it will have, you know, I will say two times or three times. But here we talk about ten thousand times. Because the main absorber of the light is hemoglobin. And the hemoglobin is the one which is mainly carrying your physiological information. And we distinguish between oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. So that means that you know the HP will have a different signature compared to HP only at different wavelengths. Of course, there is something called an isometric point where both of them merge. So those are 584 and 796. So if you no longer want to distinguish between oxy and deoxy hemoglobin, use these lasers, either at 584 or 796. Then you get the whole blood signal. But if you want to distinguish, then you do different wavelengths. So if you use different wavelengths, that means that it's going to give you different uh, signatures. Obviously, we want to be in this range, so we are typically between 600 to 1000 nanometers is what we would use. And then we can look at what is absorption by the different wavelengths. And then we can go back and look at what is going to be the oxy signal and deoxy signal. And we can distinguish between them, right? Now, where do you require uh, deoxy and oxy? So, has anybody gone to emergency rooms? Has anybody seen emergency room? Right? The first thing what they do as soon as you go into the emergency room. They want to check your oxygen. And they simply put a clip for the finger, right? What you see is what is called as oxygen saturation. Right? So it's called as PO2. So and then you see that it is it is fluctuating between 90%, 95%, 85%, 80. So as soon as it drops below 85, they say that you need oxygen. They just put a mask. Right? So essentially that is what is what is that clip is nothing but having two laser sources, right? So exactly it is going to distinguish between HV and HVO2. Right? It is a just a divide of HVO2 signal divided by the whole signal coming from HV plus HVO2. So it will get one laser signal at 796, another at some other wavelength, which is going to be sensitive to the HVO2, and then just divide the whole signal. So it is a simple laser which is having two wavelengths, and then just giving you this oxygenation, because it is just giving you this. So that means that in simple sense, the, typically the tumor also, when you have this kind of oxygenation as one of the marker, then you can find out how well they recover, right? So let me put it in the simple way, right? So when you get hurt, right, when you, when you have a wound, the first thing that happens for the wound is what we call as angiogenesis. When it's getting healed, a lot of blood vessels come together. You'll see a red patch, right? So a lot of blood is there, there right? You can see, right? The skin becomes lighter you can see a lot of blood pool coming into them. So that is called as the angiogenesis. It's trying to cure itself. Same thing happens for the tumor. So when the tumor is trying to grow, it will have a lot of angiogenesis. 
So once there is a lot of blood pool, then you are also going to look at oxygenation. Typically, because it's going to be resource hungry, typically for the tumors which are malignant, the oxygenation is going to be much lower. Right? Those which are benign, is going to be oxygenation is going to be much higher. So that is one marker which you can really use it to know whether some tumor is malignant or benign. So in simple sense, oxygenation is one of the markers for us to know what is the physiology of the tumor is. Right? So that's why you want to look at it. So that we can get this SO2 like uh, as I told you, looking at oxygenated divided by the photon. And that will give you the signal which you are looking at. Now again, so this is to just to show you whatever I was talking about. So this is the SO2 which we are talking about, hemoglobin oxygen saturation. In this, this is in the preclinical setting of the brain of the uh, rat. And then you can see all the blood vessels have certain oxygen saturation, right? Some of them have 80 percent. So this is where the blood brain barrier is typically. So at the typical uh, blood brain barrier, you'll have this kind of uh, resolution. And then you can look at what is normal versus what is tumor is. Typically, tumor oxygen saturation will be much lower compared to normal tissues. And then you can point out what is tumor is normal. Now again, um, the one thing which I have not talked about on the detection side is doing a focus detection. Right? Till now what we are talking about is there is sound wave which is getting generated and you are detecting. And of course you can also focus it to a particular location so that you can only detect the signals which are coming from there. So that also has a similar effect to what is the resolution is. Again, the similar one which we talked about what is going to be the red resolution, what is going to be the axial resolution, depending on the focal zone, again similar to ultrasound. So it's all based on the simple ultrasound one, where the red resolution is uh, depends on the unit of aperture, where uh, the axial resolution depends on the frequency. That's a typical thing which, which comes in the ultrasound. Now again, uh, there's always a trade-off between resolution and the what we call is depth of penetration, similar to ultrasound. Right? If you have high frequency, you get very good resolved images, but the problem is your depth coverage is going to be very, very limited. If you have lower frequency, you can cover more depth, but the problem is your resolution is going to suffer. Right? Similarly, in the photo acoustic effect, if you want to cover more depth, then you got to compromise on the resolution. If you want to cover less depth, you can really increase your resolution. Right? Now again, I, I just wanted to put this uh, in terms of in terms of what happens with the traditional optical imaging, which uses microscopy. Of course, there is going to be photo acoustic microscopy where they are going to cover more and more details about this. Typically, the depth which you are talking about is half and half in any microscope, except OCT, which gets you about one mm. That's why, for, for typically for the cornea, you, the typical thickness is about one mm. That's why OCT is very good, right? Earlier, what we were doing for the for the imaging of the cornea is just to use microscope, which was only getting us half mm. It is not letting us see at the back side of the cornea. Even now, it doesn't technically let us see the back side of the cornea OCT, but it gives you a little more depth. That's why in the ophthalmology setups it's very good for us. Of course, there's a fluorescence and all those things. So if you do a photoacoustic microscope, right, you can go up to beyond what is 1 mm is. You can go up to 3 mm, which means that you can really see the back of the eye, what is happening with this, you know, what we call is dendrites, which are actually absorbing the light, which are at the back. You can really image them as well. Now again, I will not go into sensitivity to the absorption, but one thing which I want to say is the detected signal of the ultrasound, which is initial pressure, is extremely sensitive to the absorption coefficient. It can really detect what we say is somewhere around getting into this, even changes up to 10 to the power minus 2. So even if, you're, if there is a physiology changes up to what we say 0.01 percent, that also it can detect very well. The sensitivity is almost at 0.01 percent. Now again, as I told you, the resolution can, can go up like ultrasound because typically you are limited by the detection only. So you can go up from the microns to all the way to the millimeters range like ultrasound does. Again, so just to put, your confocal is somewhere around here, you are talking about the of some microns, right? Whereas your OCT is somewhere here because we are able to get a tumor there. Photoacoustic can span all of this. Of course, there is not much work has been done in this space. Even though we talk about some microns in the photoacoustic, it is still in fancy. There are only one or two studies which have shown that you can get very highly resolved images. The recent one is in the, uh, I think, is in the uh, Nature Methods, which has shown a beautiful image of uh, uh, 
uh, for the acoustic microscope. Now again, um, so as I told you, the, the preclinical is what is currently the driving force for the uh, photoacoustic uh, tomography or photoacoustic imaging is, where we are talking about you know, imaging these red blood cells or melanin, which is mainly the skin imaging. And then you are talking about angiogenesis or angiogenetic responses in the preclinical settings. And then we talk about uh, this microcirculation physiology or pathology, including like you know doing a preclinical study of diabetes or, or anything like that. Drug response for screening, brain function, biomarkers, gene activity stimulus response genes is something which is happening. In the clinical space, uh, till now there are multiple papers which are published, uh, which are showing the very good promise. Again, uh, so melanoma is what has been the, the most famous one where there has been a lot of work which has done in that space. And uh, gastrointestinal tract for colonial endoscopy, because you can send a, because it's all miniaturized, even the ultrasounds you can make it miniaturized and have detection. Breast cancer, again, internal brain, uh, lymph node imaging, early response to chemotherapy, dosimetry, blood flow, oxygenation, anyway, I've shown you a couple of images of those. Now, currently, what is the limitation, right? So, where are the limitations of the photoacoustic tomography? Now, again, uh, we are not really, we are limited by the light penetration. Ultimately, your light has to be present or has to be absorbed by the tissue so that you can really see the photoacoustic effect. So that means that if your light is non-penetrable, then there is no way we can get. Currently for the soft tissue, the light beyond 5 centimeters doesn't get penetrated. Within the ANSI limit, you put the laser source. Beyond 5 centimeter depth, coverage is extremely difficult for the uh, optical one. So that means that beyond 5 centimeters, you cannot get the resolution. But there is no photoacoustic signal which is getting generated. That's one issue which I have. So can we go up to 10, 10 to 14 centimeter thickness? Can we come up with this optical clearing walls? where you combine photoacoustic with optical clearing so that on the top you clear off the tissue. You are not really cutting it off, but you use these drugs so that it clears optically and then you use that. Right? So now this limited ultrasound penetration the cavities and bones, this has been a major limitation. Ultrasound also has the same issue. There is a shadow effect which happens. Similarly here, we cannot get through the cavities or bones. Now again, uh, adaptation of the commercial ultrasound technologies not really has happened, right? So just in the earlier talk, we were talking about almost 10,000 frames per second. And you imagine how fast you can image the blood flow. Right? It opens up new possibilities, what you can image. Right? So that means that I can really look at how is the pulsation is going to be. Right? So but now that kind of a thing, getting integrated into photoacoustic setups is not really happening that much. Still, it is a very specialized equipment which people design. It's not really all the commercial ones are getting translated into this. Right? And then again, development of these reported uh, report genes, uh, which are having these genes expression. Right? So I don't know how many of you are seeing the news now. Everybody is talking about this gene editing. Right? So for example, you have a newborn baby, and then I run some gene analysis on this. I'll find out how much risk that baby is having in future to develop a cancer, or a diabetes, or some other thing. And I know the gene which is getting, you know, which is which needs to be changed. Then I can edit it, right? So that I can remove the risk, or I can reduce the risk of that baby getting either diabetes or cancer or X or Y or Z, depending on the pathways. So now for that we need to look at what is called a gene reported function. That means that how do I know that certain thing is the pathway for getting certain disease? Which is the gene which is the at the core of it? which is affecting that pathway, right? which is enabling this. So for that, we need to look at the gene expressions. Really, the genetic imaging, photoagnostic imaging is not being really used. Even ultrasound is trying to get into the same space, where we are really talking about gene imaging and how to get into space. And then again, we are also not talking about contrast agents so much. Right? <clears throat> Even the photoagnostic imaging, we are not really talking about contrast agents. So we talk about a little bit about gold nanoparticles improving the photoagnostic effect. But then you can really think about light absorption itself getting enhanced by using certain sources. So that is also something area which is, which is missing. So uh, that is where I will stop. If there are any questions, I will be happy to take. Now uh, please.
Yes, it is. Okay. So that comes into this, right? So um, let me go back to that equation and then let me explain. Okay. So this is where the absorption is. So when we talk about spatial absorption function, this A of R, which I have not put is, it's actually A of R on a lambda. Spatial absorption plus wavelength absorption. It is dependent on the wavelength. The A is what is dependent on the wavelength is. Right now we assume that there is only single source. There is only single wavelength you are doing. So that's why I have not put it. But otherwise, this A is dependent on that. We are using multiple lines. Yes. This is a function of A. Correct. No, we don't do all that. So still, uh, let me just go back to that where we were talking about the buildings. So we don't do any of that actually. In a very simple fashion, what we do is that we reconstruct every single wavelength separately. And then just look at that, that C, and then we divide. We assume that this oxy is coming because of wavelength which you have chosen for this. And then the other one is at the asbestos point which is proper. You just do that. It is not really the best one. You can do multiple fancy things which we are not doing. But how would you take the spatial spatial? Spatial is anywhere the image which is going to get. So I'll come back to the images when we talk about deep learning. Right. Uh, so we'll take a two minute break. You can just give a little bit of relaxation to your brain and then we'll come back to the deep learning. Where you need not use your brain. Thank sure. you.